We've all heard the phrase, haven't we? Time waits for no one. But if that's really true, why is it that we always spend our time waiting for a point in which we have more time? Is time really so precious, so precious, that when we get a spare moment, we hop on the internet and look up another picture of cats in hats, <laughs> dogs on skateboards? You think you don't? Look in the mirror. The one on your phone. There's an internet app for that. Yes, time is precious. It is precious, and it's because it's so precious that we, as a collective, owe it, so, owe it to we, as individuals, to only put good stuff on the internet. And we, as individuals, owe it to ourselves to only look at and engage with and read and listen to the good stuff. How are we doing with that? How many of you only look at good stuff on the internet? <laughs> I hope you're doing it better than me, because I see so much tat, so much rubbish on the internet. The internet is huge. There are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. 400 billion. It's a lot of stars. 916 billion pages on the internet, and that's just the ones that we can see. We've heard the number today, 8 billion people. 8 billion people on the planet. If there's 8 billion people on the planet and 916 billion pages on the internet, each person on the planet is going to have to read 114 different pages each before we've had a look at the internet even once. It's not sustainable, is it? Is it? We as individuals know our time is precious. So we spend it on the internet, usually dreaming about things we do when we're going to have more time. Because there is so much tat, we're getting better and better and better at filtering out the mundane, filtering out the tat, filtering out the adverts, filtering out the avalanche of irrelevance on the internet. And we have to do that so that we can see what's important. And what's important is the stuff that makes us dream. Because, it seems to me, that dreaming is mostly what we do on the internet. When we're not doing actual work, we're dreaming. Whether it's listening to something on Spotify or watching something on YouTube or having a utopian argument on Facebook or not. Whether it's looking up your holiday in the wilderness without the internet. None of it's real. It's just dreaming. And that's okay. Because it's our lives, it's our time, and our time is precious. So, we as individuals do our best to ignore that avalanche of irrelevance. And that leads us to the question, how should we as a collective that are putting the stuff up there react to this phenomenon? How are we going to react to that if, even if we put the stuff on the internet, and even if people wanted to watch it, they're not going to be able to? There's just too much information. The internet's big, isn't it? It's bigger than the Milky Way. It's so big, I've printed it out for you. Printed it out. Hang on. It's a 3D visualization of the internet. I've, I've got a few more. There you go. Pass them around. Feel free. Anyone feel the confident about catching? There you go. Don't drop it on her head. It's the internet you're dropping. It's heavy. There you go. Put one out here as well. There you go. Okay. Okay. I'm going to keep this one because this one's precious. This 3D model of the internet was manufactured on the International Space Station. This was made in space. And this is a story about not just how this was made, but why we found that we made it. Because we didn't know when we started the project. There's quite a famous data artist called Brendan Dawes. He's 
up in Leeds. I hadn't heard of him. Uh, but my UX guy admires him like an urban artist, admires Banksy, fine artist, admires Constable, modern artist, admires a brick on the ground. And he came up with a tweet one day a few years back and said, uh, if anybody, I've got, I've got some space for some commission if anybody's interested. So we grabbed him and our marketing department put him into a room just over the road in Aston University with all of the developers in the company and said to the developers, help Brendan come up with something new, some new idea, some new thought. Now, if you've ever tried to put an artist into a team managing developers, you can imagine the cynicism that was in the room with the developers. I don't think anybody really expected anything serious to come out of that meeting. But after a few months, we found that we could turn bits and bytes into 3D objects. And we could create 3D visualizations of websites. And we thought, ha, huh, OK, we've created something. Why? We didn't know. In a totally unconnected initiative, our US ambassador was in Seattle, and he was given the chance to go around slightly off-the-wall conferences to try and get some different vibes. And he found himself at a conference where they were talking about putting a 3D printer into space. Well, I don't want to go through the whole story of the next 18 months trying to figure all this out, but essentially we got to a sequence. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. On the 23rd of March 2016, the Atlas V rocket took off from Cape Canaveral, carrying supplies for the men and a 3D printer designed to work in zero gravity. On the 31st of January this year, we heard that we had successfully printed a visualization on the space station of a 3D visualization of the internet in zero gravity. And this is it. This is it. It came back down to Earth on SpaceX last month. It went over to Mel after being processed by NASA. He put it into this UPS box on Monday, and it arrived here for you you're the first people outside a few astronauts and ours to ever see this. I'll explain, if you want, why it looks like half a mountain in the break. But the point is what happened and why we created the story. Because what's interesting about it is that we may have tried to do it for some kind of, uh, I don't quite know what, but some kind of, uh, of marketing idea at the start. But it turned out that it really didn't matter about all of that because the content itself, what we'd done, what we'd made, had a higher purpose. And this plays to the fact that there's too much content on there, on the internet. Now I've got another, I'm gonna put this down for a bit because I'm gonna go slightly aside. I've got a guilty pleasure. I'm sure we've got guilty pleasures. I'm gonna to admit to one of mine to you. I binge watch the West Wing, back to back, with my wife. I've been doing it for 10 years. Anybody know the West Wing? How many people know the West Wing? Okay, okay. there's a lot of youngsters in here. So the West Wing was about a, was about a charismatic president in the White House and, uh, called Jeb Bartlett. And Jeb Bartlett uh, had a phrase called, what's next? And his phrase, his catchphrase, came into its own in an episode called Galileo 5. In Galileo 5, uh, it's, uh, he was supposed to be moderating a bunch of scientists on a day when a Mars lander, Galileo 5, was going to be landing on Mars. And in the audience were going to be a whole load of school kids, American school children, asking questions. The president was going to moderate, and, uh, and everything was going to be great. Fantastic uh, uh, photo opportunity. Fo the TV network's really interested. Absolutely brilliant. The interesting thing was, like the Beagle 2 in 2003, in real life, it didn't land properly. There was no photo opportunity. 
But the Syrians went on to say, ha, it doesn't matter, we're going to put it on anyway. It doesn't matter because the action itself of having those school kids talking to those scientists through the president was proving to put humanity first, making those kids go to the next level of their dreams, helping them visualize a part of their future, a part of humanity's future. And it didn't matter that it was no longer on telly. The content had the higher purpose. There's another reason for writing this story. Uh, and that is because I'm not the only one with this sad affliction of watching The West Wing. Not just my wife, but 10,000 other people also joined me in a secret group on Facebook online. <laughs> we, as humans, seem to self-organize into smaller groups, and smaller groups and tribes. And I think that we do that to try and reduce the amount of stress in our own lives, because it is impossible for us to process everything. We can't do it, and now that's why we've built computers to try and do the big data stuff. But by breaking down into tribes, we find ourselves with a sense of purpose and a sense of identity in one easy, manageable unit. And that's important because we can then get on with the stuff that we care about. And we're here in Aston, and it's... Uh, it's got a, a business school across the road, and that business school, one of the best in the country, one of the best in the world. So I'm sure there's a few scholars in here who understand the concept of portfolio theory. But for those that don't, portfolio theory is a description for an innovative uh, process within a system. So if you've got a system and you're trying to move it forward, whether it's a company, whether it's an organization, then it's more efficient if you try and do lots of different ideas at once let some fail and let the others connect to, to make something bigger. Portfolio theory is a way of optimizing a system to move forward. And I think that tribes is the human race equivalent of portfolio theory. By breaking down into smaller groups, we get perspective, we can work on a little problem, and we start doing things that interest us. Because there's always been too much information in the world. When I did this, I thought, you know, I was going to talk about the big internet, and there's not so many books anymore, and my bookcase is getting smaller. But I found that I had another bookcase right on the other side of the room. And then, in the next room, I had another bookcase up in the office. There's always been too much information. There's always been too much for us to take in. Have I read all the pages in these books? I own them, nonetheless. And that's because I dream of the content that's in those pages. They help me to dream my future. And I think that this is an important revelation if it's tribes breaking down into smaller and smaller groups that's important for humankind. Because there's a mantra that we often hear that we will get there if we will work together. Well, you know what? We're probably going to get there faster if we all work apart, if we all do different stuff. There are so many things out there that we shouldn't be doing the same thing. We're going to get there faster if we all work apart, especially if we want to go to Mars. So there's a place for the science fiction dreamers. There's a place for the academics. There's probably even a place for the liars, the cheats, and the vagabonds. Because we divide into groups and tribes so that we can all work on little bits of the puzzle. Because we don't know where humanity is going to go, we only know what's next. So about the same time as I started watching The West Wing 10 years ago, I was also in a, uh, in a pub in, New, in uh, Las Vegas, uh, Nine Fine Irishmen. It's about, uh, the, the name is after nine presidents of the United States. And there's a quote in designer graffiti up on the wall. It's actually a misquote. And uh, I've seen it again and again and again. It was mentioned in the West Wing, and I saw it just on Tuesday on this fridge full of beer in an incubator in Manhattan. And the quote or misquote is, never doubt <laughs> that a group of small, thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And you may have heard this quote because it happens a lot in innovation. 
there's seemingly infinite content on the web. And when we took the harebrained decision to print a 3D model of the internet in space, we were trying to break through that monotony originally. But eventually I came to understand that the, the process itself had a higher purpose. And the higher purpose is this, when you come to creating content. If you want to write, reach for the stars, write the content for yourself. Don't write it for the cult, for the media, for the audience. Write it for yourself, write it for you. And if you do that, it doesn't matter whether people read it or not. Because as you do that, you're helping yourself to visualize your dreams. When we did that, it was a huge metaphor for what we do. It resonated with me. And I think that it gives us a different perspective on why we write content and why we always have. So what's the takeaway? Well, the first takeaway is that if you were planning to start manufacturing things in space, you're too late. <laughs> but that's not really the takeaway. The takeaway is to do something great you need to start with something small. But it does help to have a huge ambition. And along the way, you're going to need to be reminded of your ambition and your focus. And you write content to help yourself build feedback loops. And that's where the content comes in. It's not to sell it to others. It's to sell it to yourself. Because great content, content worthy of the web, is content that you write for yourself to understand where you are now and where you want to go. Thank you, and dream on. Thank you.